they titled What is Recovery? Myself and Claire met to try and think of some way or some title for this, this talk. Initially, there was Celebrating Recovery. Um, and when, when we met to discuss um, the title, we settled on What is Recovery? Because I can honestly say that, that what I'm going to talk about is I don't have an answer on What is Recovery? Right? Um, I think that there is a lot of people, or a lot of people, who are similarly confused, could not provide an answer, but we'll talk about that. Um, half eight, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you may only get to about quarter past eight, but I'm absolutely fine with that. If I can say something in half an hour, 45 minutes, instead of being long-winded and going on for an hour, I'm fine with that. So I'm going to start with something of why this issue of recovery, or what is recovery, when it came into my mind. I suppose, <clears throat> not my mind, my life. I actually had, during my PhD, I had um, a part-time job here on a research project in St. Patrick's. Now, I was never a patient in St. Patrick's, and initially when I started the job, I walked into the building, in through the front door, and I was shocked because the type of facility that I was used to is nothing like St. Patrick's. I thought that it was just a palace, and I wondered, how could anyone not recover in an environment like this? So it, it brought to mind, well, maybe environment's not the only thing that matters. And sometimes I would like to bring people who are here complaining about the facilities down to County Loud to see our facilities. So the one thing about the project was it was um, patient-centred care or patients' views of care in both the public and private system. It was this, I was on it for six months. And I, I was curious because all of a sudden... Now, I was in the second year of my PhD, right? And all of a sudden, I was hearing this word recovery. I had never heard it before. Certainly, I, well, obviously I'd heard the word before, but I'd never heard it in such a, a, a fashion being used in, in Dublin. And I thought initially, is it a Dublin thing that that recovery is being thrown around? A barrage of hearing it. Every second word that everybody said was recovery. And so, in one way... I started, I, I started to read about it, and I found in the literature, recovery was popping up everywhere. But I still wasn't having my questions answered. Well, what is it? Right? So then I started asking people, deliberately going around to people, not, not, just, just as, out of curiosity, asked them. They would be talking about recovery, and I, I would let them talk, and then I would say, well, what is it? What is recovery? And unfortunately, I still, I still have difficulty. Usually people cite information or give some very broad and general answer. But nobody gave me an adequate answer to what recovery is. But the other side of that was, because I was hearing it so much, it was like this mystery that I wasn't part of, this story that I wasn't being involved in. So it, it, in a way, it was a sort of crisis. Because I felt, well, if I know nothing about this, well, maybe I'm not recovered. Maybe I, I, recovery is not, not part of my life because I'm not fitting under these categories. And yet, that, that was strange, because I was confident that I was well, but I didn't fit into this box of what is recovery, or this philosophy. And I also didn't understand it. And admittedly now, I still don't understand it. So that was where it came for me. I decided in my wisdom and cynicism that recovery is a buzzword. There's very little substance behind it, right or wrong. There are people who have some idea of what they're aiming for. Um, I'm not entirely sure who I can say where this buzzword is coming from. I hear it a lot from, from people who are in jobs or people who are, who are, let's just say, observers. I hear it from people who would be self, have self-experience. And yet, I, I'm, I'm not seeing any evidence. I'm someone who wants to see numbers. I want to see numbers. I want to see evidence that there is recovery, not just talk that there's recovery. I also don't want to be intimidated by the word recovery, and I have felt intimidated. So in 2011, just not long before I started here, I decided that I was going to share my personal story. I was initially, initially asked by the CEO at the time of Mental Health Ireland, Ted Tierney, to talk to a group, a conference of teenagers. And because my special interest is youth mental health, that, that I decided to do it. It was the first time I had ever spoken about it in public. And I'm going to give you a brief, a brief story, a brief example 
of what type of, in, what type of communication I use to different groups. I started off with 200 teenagers. I've spoken to psychiatrists, doctors, nurses. So it's a, it's a wide range of audiences that are hearing this information. And yet, even though I'm using the word recovery, I have to say that in all my years, with my psychiatrist, with all the nurses I knew, my family, the word recovery was never mentioned once. It would still not be mentioned. Not because anyone was against it, it just wasn't necessary to talk about it. So this is one thing, when I met Claire last year in October in Cork, giving a conference, this is a sample of what I gave at that conference. My mental health difficulties started as a young teenager. In secondary school, I noticed a change in my thought processes. I wasn't, I wasn't able to think clearly. I started hearing voices. This escalated until I really struggled to think and concentrate. I ended up very confused, constantly distracted and paranoid of others. I didn't understand what was happening, but I knew it wasn't right. My mood spiraled downwards. I wasn't able to sleep and became very isolated. Within six months, I had become very depressed and agitated. I attempted suicide and was subsequently brought to the child psych psychiatric services in my area. I was then admitted to the adolescent unit at a psychiatric hospital in Dublin for observation and assessment, St. John of God's. Five weeks later, my parents were called to a meeting to discuss the results. All that was said was that I was showing signs of a serious mental illness. To balance that news, my parents were told that there were a number of positive aspects in my case which would be significant in the long term. These included level of intelligence, creativity and personality. The prognosis depended on how well I coped outside the hospital setting, returning to school, maintaining friendships and not being isolated were identified as key to helping my progress in the years ahead. However, I was unable to return to school from 16 years old and friendships quickly disappear disappeared within a year of the first hospitalisation. Consequently, I was isolated. For the following two years, I was medicated for the symptoms of schizophrenia and regularly attended a child psychiatrist. I was admitted to the hospital in Dublin a number of times in this period. After 18, at 18 years old, I was admitted, I, was, I transitioned to the adult mental health services. I had a psychiatrist, luckily a good one. It was a classical, classic, classical, classic biomedical model of care, but to be fair, that wasn't my psychiatrist's choice. She didn't have the power to employ a psychologist in the local service. She couldn't, she couldn't provide access to education courses for me. She couldn't change the culture of discrimination which existed at that time. What she could do was make sure that we tried a lot of medications with the hope that we would find one that helped, that helped and had little side effects. Medication was always troublesome. Side effects ranged from mild to severe. For example, with one medication, my joints froze. Another impaired my vision. I gained weight, lost weight, became more depressed, lost my balance, slept too much or slept too little. I had to avoid sunlight with one medication, which resulted in a love of autumn and winter as an adult and a complete dislike of sunny or hot weather. Some medications alleviated the symptoms of the illness. Some made no difference whatsoever. The trick was to find a balance between the alleviation of symptoms and, the, and side effects, and it was a long road to find that balance. Between 18 and 24 years old, the story repeated each year. I was admitted to the local psychiatric hospital for three or four months, sometimes twice a year. As an outpatient in the adult service, I attended the weekly clinic and continued to take medication. There was an emotional impact of both the child and adult services, but I found the adult system more hostile. I was legally an adult, but I was still a child in need of protection. The child service had a more caring and individual approach. As an inpatient in the child service, I had access to a team of nurses, an occupational therapist, a psychologist and a psychiatrist. I had a daily timetable of activities, but the child service was not perfect. My inpatient care was in Dublin. My outpatient care was in County Loud. Any progress that was made while I was an inpatient was fruitless because I was discharged into a social, developmental and educational void. 
The age range of the adolescent ward in Dublin was 12 to 18 years old. In the adult hospital, I was locked in an environment with an age range, age range of up to 65 years old, which was frightening, but still interesting. I, at some at different times, I actually became like a secondary carer to the older, older people, older women in particular. I used to play, play games with them, play chess and different things. So there were parts of it that were actually nice. I nostalgi nostalgically refer to those first years in the adult system as the David Attenborough era because I felt like an observer who was given access to a world I didn't belong to. Moving into the adult service felt like starting a waiting game. I waited for time to pass or for a day when I would have enough courage to end it all with suicide. It was an ongoing struggle to hold on to some sense of self-worth when everything around me was telling me to give up and accept the bleak circumstances. I think staff in the adult services would have described me as quiet, helpful and pleasant. Privately, I was feeling lost, scared, angry, trapped and invisible. I was clearly consumed with a lot of contradictions, which were difficult to make sense of and had nothing to do with an illness. I was simply caught be between opposing realities. The memory of the reality before I got ill, which was positive and progressive, and the reality I was stuck in, which was relentless and unforgiving. As a broad comparison, the child service gave some hope of recovery. The adult service stole that hope and not only made it difficult to recover, but difficult to live. The child service recognised my age group between 16 and 18 years old and provided a range of care options and interactions with other young people and practitioners. The adult service ignored my age or age-related requirements and in doing so ignored my any potential to recover. Nonetheless, I refused to believe that I was a lost cause, no matter how much the adult system, system acted as a reminder to that reality on a daily basis. In fact, I came to a quick, quick conclusion that, the, that it was the adult mental health system that was the lost cause, rather than the many young people I encountered over the years through service involvement. There are a number of inconsistencies and contradictions in the messages communicated by the adult mental health system, which have an emotional, developmental and long-term impact on young people. Similarly, recovery is made even more challenging when the system of care and treatment shows little or no awareness of the realities faced by a young person outside the care setting. The chance for some relief from my situation appeared in the horizon with three consecutive changes. I call them my golden triangle. The first was the introduction of olanzapine to the Irish market. I was the first patient in the local service to test a new medication, and within a few weeks, I was a different person. I had more clarity and consciousness, and the side effects were bearable. Shortly after starting this new medication, I received a series of sessions with a psychology fellow in, Bo in Beaumont in Dublin. In six one-hour one sessions, I transitioned from being a person to patient to being a person again. It was a complete liberation and validation of my mind, which gave me an unprecedented level of confidence in my ability to recover. Another ch significant change occurred in 2001. I was accepted onto a short return to education course in the local adult education centre in my area. That course turned the key and unlocked the door to my future a new and hopeful future in the education system. I followed the short introductory course with a one-year general studies course and a one-year Leaving Certificate course. Following the Leaving Certificate results in August 2003, I was accepted at university to undertake a Bachelor of Arts degree. I completed the BA and then completed a Master of Arts, to Arts at another university. I have since completed my PhD. I have not been hospitalised or significantly unwell since 2001. The overall benefits of returning to education were huge. I thrived in a learning environment. I felt more connected to the world. Formal education provided me with the vocabulary and critical thinking skills required to communicate ideas and analyse problems in the hope of finding solutions to those problems. Through education, I was able to redefine my experiences in a more positive way. I was able to build a new context for mental illness, challenge negative attitudes, and try to highlight the need for better support for young people with an enduring mental health issue across the entire country. 
I have particular views in terms of service reform, and I am most critical of systematic failures within the adult system which have a negative impact on the lives of young people. For instance, it would be better for young people if they, had, if they were officially recognised as requiring specific reports with regard to mental health care. I also believe that the transition from the child to the adult services at 18 years old is more damaging than service providers realise because it can mean the difference between recovery and long-term disability. The establishment of a specific youth mental health service could reduce the isolation and confusion experienced by young people and address relevant life challenges for this age group. There are a number of life challenges which are noteworthy. Education, social connections, friendship, identity exploration and discovery and sexual health. The transition from the child to the adult services at such a crucial, crucial stage in emotional, emotional and intellectual development has the power to dictate the future of every young person with a mental health difficulty. Some young people will be lost and forgotten in the adult system. Some will lose years of their lives to service involvement. Some will recover but require, require long-term support from the mental health services. The lucky ones will recover and reach their full potential as adults. I consider myself one of the lucky ones. It is unfair, this is an opinion, it is unfair to place the burden of an inadequate adult mental health service on the shoulders of young people and then expect them to flourish in spite of or despite insurmountable challenges. It is time to reshape mental health services in order to provide the best possible chance of recovery for young people with the most practical delivery of services in order to achieve good life outcomes. I am acutely aware that my chances of recovery were greatly reduced as a result of having to transition from the child to adult services at 18 years old. Of course, it is impossible to say what would have happened if there was a more age-appropriate service available at the time. However, it is possible to say that my recovery was the result of a combination of good family support, a psychiatrist who kept up to date with developments in medicated treatment and a high level of self-determination. Not every young person has the level of family support or self-determination required to recover in the adult system. In fact, the odds are stacked against any young person who transitions from the child to the adult services and does not have a network of support behind them or the determination to pursue their goals and ambitions. This makes recovery difficult, sometimes impossible, and perhaps an even greater challenge for the individual, families and practitioners than illness treatments and hospitalisation. So my curiosity in what recovery meant and where my life fitted into, where what, in, into that theme of recovery, that, as I said, by the time I was in the second year of my PhD, I had achieved a lot, but I still was confused by this recovery notion. Alongside the confusion, it was the intimidation that scared me most. Why was I intimidated by something that seemed so mystical when I, all I had to do was look at my own life and my own achievements and I had an example? So my, my, it, the, my interest in this and my curiosity led to a personal mission to identify problems in the service and think of solutions and actions. And this is what I've come up with so far. So I made two tables. Now I've broken up the tables because of the size of them. So this is the, first, this is the table, first part of table number one. Inconsistencies, contradictions and challenges. I identified the problem, which was diagnosed with mental illness. The treatments and the progno treatment and prognosis was medicated and hospitalised. The, the, the reality of that, the effect it had on my identity, was trauma. A sharp disconnect between the life before and the life after the onset of illness. The second element was stigma of mental illness. Treatment and prognosis. The treatment was, apart from medication, return to normality as quickly as possible. Return to school. Maintain peer network. The prognosis of that was a much better chance of recovery if everything returned to normal after discharge from hospital. The reality it was alienation. School system poorly equipped to support students with a mental illness, loss of peer network, loss of social connections, loss of academic or vocational opportunities. The problem, transition from the child to the adult services at 18 years old. 
the treatment and prognosis, medicated, hospitalised, little or no access to talking therapies, see how it goes from here attitude. The reality, an, an annihilation of selfhood and identity, an apathy for life and self-stigma. Another problem, employability and social disability. Find a part-time job or attend a course to rebuild motivation. Interest in life, peer network, social and vocational capacity. Difficulty with that was otherness. No educational qualifications means unemployable. Limited access to formal education courses, hospitalised annually, life stagnated. So this is where the contradictions and inconsistencies between the messages you're receiving and what's actually there in reality to catch you when you come out of a hospital or when you need support. It varies greatly across the country. So practical considerations. So from the, the, from the first table, we can say that there's one problem, first problem, an inadequate service structure and lack of recognition of age group 12 to 25 years old. Solution, restructuring and recognition. How do we do that? Extend the child service officially beyond 18 years old and build an intermediary system specifically around the needs of young people with mental health issues. At the centre of the service should be full recognition of the experiences of that age group and transition from childhood to adulthood. My GP, who has since passed away at the time when I was ill, was a great source of um, information for my mother and a source of wisdom. And there was he turned around to my mother and said that, um, that it, was, it was actually extraordinary. Given what happens humans during the adolescent years, that, that it's extraordinary so many of us make it through. Um, second issue, a problem, training of service providers. How do we match that up? Well, we rewrite the training curricula. We offer training to existing staff and we develop a new model of qualifications for youth mental health. The action, the training of service providers should mirror the intermediary system. This requires a complete redefinition of child and adolescent mental health to youth mental health. Another problem, geography of resources. And I think there's plenty of people who will know how this operates and how it feels. Geography of resources and inconsistency with care facilities can dictate outcomes in youth mental health, and it can be as simple as that. Improved recovery outcomes or chance of recovery by creating synthesis between the delivery of treatment and the location of that treatment. The action, reorganise facilities or build new ones which can provide both inpatient and outpatient treatment in as many regions as possible. Remove the inconsistencies in care provision and reduce the level of disruption experienced by the young, by young, by the young, by the young person, families, carers and practitioners. Now these all may look like pipe dreams, but this is what's needed. So until we do that, stop talking about recovery. I, that, that wasn't in order. And the fourth one. I'm afraid I don't have a five-point plan, it's a four-point plan. The current system focuses on mental, a mental health diagnosis and does not treat vocational or social disabilities in young people. The solution? Develop a youth mental health system that can lead to third level education, employment, independence and security in adult life. The action? Establish a dedicated liaison programme as part of the youth mental health system, the, the youth mental health service. A dedicated group of people can be employed to act in the health, social and vocational interests of a young person. Now, it's my idea. I don't care who does it. Just do it. Identify care options in each area. Identify routes to education, routes to employment and housing and source funding. Now, the interesting thing about what happened with us with the recession was that a lot of people seem to take, use their inaction or, or say that their inaction was the result of not having money. And many of us during the Celtic Tiger didn't see any difference with how we were treated now and how we were treated then. Money is not the difficulty, it's willingness. Oh, that's... So I am always mindful and that this was my approach to doing any of these talks. And I don't know, Claire didn't say it, but actually I started giving the first talk in 2011. This is my last. I'm not sharing any more of my personal story in any groups. Um, I, I, will, will, I am willing to work in the background with people, 
but this, this will be the end of this journey. Uh, maybe that's part of my recovery. Next chapter. Uh, I am always mindful not to target any individual or one category of service providers in order to highlight dysfunction in the mental health system or society. I don't need enemies. I need friends in order to make an impact. In saying that, I, am, I also expect honesty, honesty, not deceit or underhanded behaviours. So, of course, I have made a few enemies over the years but they're enemies that you're quite happy to make. I was asked recently how I would briefly describe my viewpoint on recovery and mental health reform. I answered with the following. I am a rational egalitarian with an appreciation for idealism and a complete intolerance of BS. This person gave a perfect Irish response, which was, fair enough, (laughs) and moved on. So I want to give you an end with just a couple of stories because my recovery is not just my recovery, it's my family's recovery. And this journey, they had their own experiences and their own difficulties because I was, I'm the youngest of four. Of course, I was the baby of the family. It was going to impact every single one of them. My sister, when I became ill, was doing her leaving certificate. My other sister was in university and my brother was trying to establish himself in a business My mother was working as a teacher, so everything that was going on in the background in our family life, I could be in John O'Gall's for four or five months. She still had to go into school every day and teach 30, 35 children and not show them that anything was going on. So it took some, some willpower and strength on their part to keep life going. So I'm going to give you a couple of stories about myself. Uh, just one story about myself and my sister, Sheena. She knew, myself and Sheena are very close. She's only 11 months older than me. Um, but uh, I always say I was a surprise. But um, she, uh, we were in the car one day a couple of years ago. And she has three children. So we take any opportunity we can when she doesn't have the children to go around together and have a little chat. We were in the car. I said something. I'm not, it doesn't matter what I said. And she went quiet for a couple of seconds. And she just, we, she started, she, then she parked and she sat back and she says, do you know, Lisa, I always forget. Most of the time I forget what we went through and I forget what you live with. And then some, on some occasion you come out with something or you say something or you do something and it reminds me. And to me, I was glad to hear that because it meant that she had rega- she'd regained control of her life. And she was living her life. And I wasn't a burden on her anymore. She was quite happy that I could look after myself and I was independent. Doesn't stop her trying to control me, though. And another small little story. I'm going to end with it. And this, this is the nice part. I was on a, the Late Late recently because I was part of the Outsider Art Project. Um, and I have now... Uh, at 20 years old, I got my, fir- I got my, my first niece was born. She's now 18 years old. The youngest is, um, well, at the time of this story, was five, is five years old. Right? So this was only a few weeks ago. And my parents, because my sister and her husband uh, were coming up to Dublin with me, or into the programme with me, that my parents were minding their three children. And they thought, of course, my parents were, of any, any parents, they were terrified. One, that I wouldn't mess it up. Two, that I wouldn't embarrass them. And three, that I'd be okay. Right? Doesn't matter what age they are, they still worry. So they had the three little children there in the house. They also had my dog. And they thought, right, we'll settle down and we'll watch this. Turns out, well, as it turned, at the same time, my sister-in-law, who's married to my husband, was expecting their seventh child. Right? Any day. Right? So we got word before the late, late that um, Emma... Uh, thought she was going into labour and they were going to have to go to Drogheda. So the car pulled up into the driveway. Out from the car jumped six other little children with a pillow under their arm and a bag on their back with their pyjamas and their teddies into my house. So my parents thought they were going to have this nice, quiet little time watching this segment. Instead, they ended up with both of them in their chairs, nine children on the floor from the age range of 18 to 5 and my dog in the middle. And my father said that when the segment finished, um, the children burst into a round of applause for the whole thing because they loved it. And of course, they wanted to go up to the exhibition and meet the different artists and everything. But that was another example of my parents feeling good and feeling like they had achieved something. It also, to me, it meant that the next generation are not carrying a burden. 
they're not carrying a uh, mental illness as something negative. Um, so that was one thing. And the other, the other side of it is, is that the children all started to come when I was 20 years old. Right? So I became an auntie in the middle of the years of being unwell. And my, my, my eldest niece, when she was about three or four years old, started all her conversations with, now I would have been 23, 24, when you were young, Auntie Lisa. So that straight away, I realised, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not the baby anymore, I have a problem with this, um, but it also meant that there was a new generation coming. So when they were growing up, I wanted to give them a good example. And I hope I did that. Um, and then over the years, they all, when I was babysitting them, they all came into the room with me, into the, where I was doing my art at home, and they wanted to do art. So they had a little table with a little chair, and they were doing their drawings and everything. And they still, to this day, produce, send me or bring up drawings for me to put on my wall. So I think that, that as a family, we have certainly come a long way. And that, I'll end it there. Thank you.